Thank you very much to CNPS for inviting me to come back. Um, sometimes we get the question, what does Audubon have to do with California native plants? And I hope by the time you get to the end of this presentation, you'll understand why our two organizations partner so frequently and why we have such a, um, a friendly relationship between the two organizations. We think we go very, very well hand in hand. Yeah, so if we can get the, the front, let's see, if I can leave the back lights on and turn these front lights off, that would be great. Sorry, technical challenges with the lights is always a, a given with any presentation. Well, while, while they're figuring out the lights, let me give a couple of prefaces for my presentation. Um, so as you can see, it's called Attracting Birds to Your Garden. So we're talking specifically about making a backyard space to be healthy habitat. Um, we're using a program that we call our Bird Sanctuary Program. So a lot of what I'm talking about is referenced in our uh, packet manual. Uh, which is available if people are interested in it. It has a lot of information specifically about what the birds are looking for and a lot of the information that I'm going to be talking about tonight. Okay. Um, the second preface that I want to give is I'm assuming that I'm talking to a general audience of people that are interested in California native plants. So I'm not going to be focusing a lot on some of the specifics of what plants to plant and how to plant them and how much water they get and how much sun they need. Um, rather, I'm going to be talking more about the why. Why is this important? How is this going to work to attract birds to the garden? What plants might attract specific birds? So we're going to talk about our little neighborhood birds that we might be getting in our gardens. Um, now, if there are questions about specific plants, I'm happy to answer what I can. Anything I can't answer, I will refer to our CNPS folks, because they know the, the nitty-gritty details about you know, how deep to put it, and where are the shade, and things like that. And I will leave the, the details to them. So I'm going to be talking a little bit more, though, about the why. Why do we do this? Who is it going to be attracting? And how do we make those connections between our local birds and the plants that we're going to be interested in? OK. Let's go get this to wake up. There we go. So as I said, this is part of our bird sanctuary program. And the goal of the bird sanctuary program is to basically help counteract the urban development crises that we see in our area. Now, I use that word crises a little bit loosely. What I'm talking about is basically anytime you have humans coming into what used to be natural habitat, you're going to have a conflict. You're going to have an area that is no longer quite as suitable to the wildlife that is native to that area as it used to be. And if we don't think about that and we don't do things to counteract that, what ends up happening is we end up with an area that is no longer welcoming to our native habitat, I mean to our native wildlife. The Bird Sanctuary Program is trying to help counteract that. We're trying to help uh, overcome some of the problems that the animals are finding with loss of habitat. We're trying to overcome some of the uh, trends and population declines that we're seeing, specifically in birds, but you'll see how it relates to other species in just a minute. We're also trying to help counteract some of the damaging trends that a lot of landscaping has done to our habitat. Things like excess pesticide and herbicides and excessive water use and things like that. I think most people have sort of clued into the idea that, you know, we do really live in a dry habitat. Saving water is a good thing. So we're going to talk about how that can be done by creating this healthy habitat. Okay. Now, I am going to be using birds as sort of a shorthand. Obviously, I'm from the Audubon Society. Birds are what I love. That's what we're going to be focusing on. But when I use the term birds in reference to creating backyard habitat, I'm really using them as an umbrella species. Because if you're gardening in a way that's going to be attracting birds, you're also going to be attracting all of these others and more. You're going to be attracting uh, all sorts of pollinators and insect eaters. You're going to be attracting lizards. Um, and just as a little anecdote, I have, I don't know, maybe a 20 by 6 foot patio that's all concrete. Not the most hospitable area for animals. But because of various gardening things that I have done, I have happy little populations of lizards that come to visit and torment my cats and um, birds and spiders and hummingbirds and uh, all sorts of things that come to visit the patio space. So 
by creating habitat for the birds, we're going to be creating habitat for a lot of other wildlife as well. Okay. So why do we care about this? Why is it important that we do create this habitat? And this is sort of the big question of what does it matter? Why does it matter if our habitats are healthy? One of the reasons is because of the services that these animals provide for us. So the biggest thing, and the, I think the easiest way to hook people into creating backyard habitat is natural pest control. So I mentioned that I've got lizards that live in my patio. Well, that means I know they're going to be eating some of those bugs that I don't necessarily want. Um, I have uh, chickadees and whatnot that come to visit, and they're going to be picking the grubs and the potato bugs off of my plants. Um, I had an infestation of cabbage moths, cabbage moth caterpillars in some of my plants that I was growing, and I soon found chickadees and other things that were coming to visit. So they were helping me control those pests without my having to do a whole lot to, to do much with it. Um, bigger areas, we can talk about other pest control, things like owls and um, some of the woodpecker species and things like that. We also have very, very tight pollination syndromes. And I think this is something that's been in the news a lot recently with the colony collapse disorder problems that we're seeing with the honeybees. Now, honeybees are not native to North America. They're not native to California. But we have some very, very important connections with the honeybees with our food crops, right? We lose our honeybees. We don't get our almond trees pollinated. Well, a lot of our native plants and animals are tightly connected as well. And so when we plant native plants, we're helping assist those pollination syndromes. And in turn, we're going to be helping pollinate all sorts of other things as well, not just what's in our backyards. Very important for seed dispersal. Um, hopefully nobody is squeamish, and when I talk about natural processes, you're not going to get upset with me. But there are some seeds that actually require the passage of an animal's gut to be able to germinate. If they don't go through the animal, they can't germinate. So we need our birds eating the seeds. We need those rodents eating the seeds. And then they help spread them. And I always tell people, especially this time of the year, you sit in under any tree that's got berries on it. You're going to discover just how effective these little guys are at seed dispersal all over your car. But in theory, they're going to be spreading that wherever they happen to land and have to defecate and fly off. Um, we'll talk more about the cedar wax wings, but I can always tell when they're here because my car gets decorated with their little blessings. Um, but it's very important for the seed dispersal. And then, as I mentioned, we live in a dry habitat. If we're planting things that are native to, let's say, England, like those lovely green lawns that everybody seems to like, it requires a ton of water. England is a very wet place. The plants there are adapted to lots and lots of water. You plant things here, that don't belong here, that aren't adapted to our dry environment, you're going to be having to supplement with a lot of water. And as you know, we are now entering our third dry winter. Water is going to be a major concern. And, and some sources have stated that over the next 20 years, water is going to be the most limiting resource on the planet. Energy is going to be important. Fuel is going to be important. Land is going to be important, but really it's going to come down to water rights and water resources. So by planting habitat that is healthy and appropriate to the area, we're going to help out the area by conserving water. And then the last thing is we have a responsibility. And I was uh, listening to, I think it was an NPR production, that they were talking about trying to recover some of the animals that were in steep decline. Because basically it was humans that caused the decline in the first place. And, you know, especially as organizations that are involved in conservation, we sort of feel like it's our responsibility to help undo some of that damage that we've done. You know, hundreds of years of uh, uh, development and dispersal by humans, we didn't always know what we were doing. We didn't always understand the consequences of all of the development that we were doing. And we feel that it's our duty, it's our responsibility to help overcome some of that uh, conflict. And the last thing I put in here is because, I don't know about you guys, but if I go to a park and all I see is grass and crows, it doesn't really do it for me. I'm not going to get the same impact as if I go to a garden that has lots of different plants and flowers and colors and shapes and butterflies and bees and caterpillars and grasshoppers and 
chickadees and hummingbirds, and I'm hearing all sorts of lovely, wonderful sounds. That's what makes my heart happy. So I think it's proven, too, uh, we talk about the nature deficit disorder. The more connected you are to the natural world and the more variety you have in the natural world, the better it is for our emotional well-being. It just makes us happy. So we encourage people to create healthy backyard habitat for those purposes. Okay. So I think most of us kind of understand where the threats to our biodiversity, to our native plants, to our native animals are coming from. The ones that I'm going to mostly be talking about are the invasive plants and urbanization. I've already mentioned a lot about development and urbanization. Basically, it's just a result of habitat, or it causes habitat loss. The one thing I also am going to talk about, though, is I'm going to talk about invasives. I'm going to talk a little bit about animals that plants, at, sorry, animals and plants that are here that aren't supposed to be here, and some of the effects that they have on our habitat and our native animals. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. Now, I like to bring everybody back to the basics so that we can remind ourselves what are we looking for when we're creating healthy habitat? Um, basically, we're looking for these four things. We're looking for food, water, shelter, and a safe habitat, and that's my shorthand of saying a safe place to raise their young. If your backyard is able to provide these four things, you're going to have a thriving biodiversity, you're going to have healthy natural pest control, you're going to have um, water conservation bonuses, you're going to have emotional well-being. All of these things are going to be your benefit when you provide these four things. And when I talk about these four things, I want you to keep these three concepts in mind. So whether I'm talking about providing food, water, shelter, or have safe habitat, we're talking about primarily providing it in a way that is as natural as possible, creating as diverse a habitat as possible. I, uh, a lot of people have heard this, but nature likes diversity. It does not like, it is not as stable when you have a single species. You want to have a lot of different species. It allows the environment, allows the ecosystem to bounce back from uh, problems. It allows it to fill lots of different roles. And it allows it to support a lot of different other organisms. And you also want to be as consistent. And I'll put this little caveat down as much as possible. Sometimes it's hard to be as consistent as you would like. But if you're trying to attract animals, specifically birds, to your backyard space, you want to make sure that the birds know this is a good place to come and they don't have to guess. Is it Tuesday? Is there going to be food for me today? Is it Wednesday? Is there going to be water? You want to be as consistent as possible. So when we talk about providing the things that the birds and the animals need, keep those three things in mind. Okay. Okay. So, as I mentioned, when possible, we always prefer to pro provide food specifically, but other sources as well, in natural sources. And one of the things that you'll hear me talking about, which of course is why we're here with the California Native Plant Society organization, is when we produce, or when we um, provide natural sources of food, we want to be providing our native plants. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about why that's so important, but just kind of keep that in the back of your mind. that. When I say natural sources, I'm really talking about native plants, plants that belong to the habitat. So we have a whole bunch of native plants that are wonderful sources of food for our animals. And I'm just giving you a brief lip of uh, examples. So this definitely does not cover all of the possibilities. There are wonderful handouts uh, from the California Native Plant Society on the back table. I encourage you to take a look at these. But I just wanted to give you some examples so that you can see the variety of what we're talking about. So these are seed producing plants. These are ones that are going to be your perennials or your annuals that are going to be dropping seeds on the ground. They're going to be providing food for the animals that have the short seed bills. And you can see you have big bushes, you've got wildflowers that are nice and low, you've got grasses, you've got we do have a native thistle. If you didn't know this, it's a beautiful plant. They actually do have a native one. And we have uh, herbs that are going to be producing flowers and whatnot. So there's a wide variety of different plants that are available that help produce flowers. I mean, not seeds. And we'll talk about those as well. One plant that I just adore, and Arvind Kumar and I, can, uh, we used to talk about this, and we could wax eloquent about the oak tree for hours and hours and hours. Um, if you have space, and if you have the time, so you're not going to be there for two years and moving out, 
Uh, we encourage everybody that can to plant coast live oaks. They are one of the best um, ecosystem supports and providers in the area, really. And I think Arvin told me that he read an article that each coast live oak can support up to 300 different species of organisms. So that's including you know, microorganisms, but it's really talking about the insects that live on the bark and that pollinate the flowers, that live in the, the, the canopy, it's the birds and the insects and the lizards and the spiders that come eat the other insects, it's the predators that then come eat those birds, but it's an incredibly important ecosystem resource. They are very long-lived and they are pretty slow-growing, so not a lot of people like to plant them because they want to see results quickly, but that's why we say, got a little patience and you got a good spot that would uh, support a nice live, live oak, um, we encourage you to use that as a seed producer. We also have some very fun native plants that are berry producers. And these ones, I just absolutely love both of these plants. This is the, the California Toyon and this is the coffee berry. And both of these plants produce these beautiful red berries that the birds, especially in the winter, are just going to go nuts over. We're going to talk more about the birds that are going to come visit them. For those of you that aren't familiar with the Toyon, um, the nickname is the Christmas berry because they blossom and start producing berries in the late fall. And by the winter, they have this beautiful crop of red berries. Um, here's a little bit of trivia for you. Um, the hills of Southern California, specifically around Los Angeles, are covered with toyon. And in the winter, they produce these beautiful red berries and the hills turn red. And when people came to the area and were looking for names and stuff, they thought they were a species of holly. And so that is where the name Hollywood gets its name from. Not from holly, from toyon. That's our native plant. And unlike some of the non-native plants, like the pyrocanthus and some of the other ones, these are not going to be fermenting and doing weird things to the animals that eat them. We'll talk about that as well. The coffee berry is another uh, shrubby bush that grows very well in this area. And this is an early berry, but as it ripens, they turn this really rich, dark chocolate brown, which the birds just go crazy for. And the rodents like them too. We'll talk a little bit more about that as well. So one thing I should mention, it's kind of hard for me to see you guys, so you guys can see me, I can't really see you, but if you do have a question, I don't know, raise your hand and click, you know, click your fingers or something, I'm happy to answer questions while I'm talking, you don't have to just sit here and listen to me, um, I'm happy to answer, I just, I may not see you, so I don't know, throw something at me or stomp your foot or something if you have a question, I'd be happy to answer it. Okay, we also have some wonderful uh, plants that are fabulous for producing nectar. And one thing I want you to notice is the plants that are really good at producing nectar have a very typical shape to them. A lot of them are red, but they have very tubular flowers. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about why that's so important for the animals that depend on this nectar. You'll also notice that the flowers oftentimes are suspended or hanging or dangling. It's hard for a lot of animals to get into them. So they're very specialized for certain types of animals, which again, we'll talk about. And basically, they're waiting for the right pollinator. If this animal, this bird, does not come pollinate them, there aren't a lot of other things that are going to come visit them because of the placement of those flowers. So keep this in mind as we start talking about the birds, what kind of an animal might be able to, um, to visit them. <coughs> now, a couple of things to note about these ones. So the California fuchsia, I just planted one for the first time in a pot this year to see if it would grow okay in a container. And I have to tell you, it just took off like gangbusters. And as I said, I have a 20 by 6 concrete patio, and I've been having hummingbirds coming all summer and all fall coming to visit. <coughs> this is one of their favorite plants, and it's been doing very well. I'm going to hack it back as soon as the flowers die off, and I'll wait for it to come back. Um, so. All of these plants that I'm talking about, they have been tried and true and tested by either people with yards, Arvind, um, most of these came from Arvind Kumar's backyard, or I've been planting them in my, my patio and things like that. So we know what we're talking about. These are good plants. Um, this fuchsia flower gooseberry I like to bring up because this is one that I am very, very fond of. Um, the one thing we caution people is that it is a gooseberry. And if you guys know anything about berries, they are 
thorny. They've got big prickers and thorns. And one of the things that we often tell people is this is a good layering plant. So for example, if you have a bird bath that you don't want your neighborhood cats to get to, gooseberry is a wonderful plant to plant around the bird bath, and then you can plant something else around it that doesn't have the thorns, but it'll keep some of those pests and predators out of the areas that you don't want to want them. So we'll talk a little bit more about that as well. Okay. Now, one thing that I cannot stress enough for a healthy habitat is the need for this entire category. Grubs, worms, caterpillars, beetles, earwigs, insects, all sorts of fun things, okay? Now, obviously, you can't plant a plant and grow insects. That doesn't work. But by planting appropriate plants, you're going to be attracting insects. And then, in turn, you're going to be attracting this whole suite of birds that we're going to talk more about that are going to be coming because they're the insect eaters. One thing that is very, very important to realize, if you are creating healthy habitat, you might get a little bit of plant damage. Right? There's going to be caterpillars eating your, your leaves. There may be some flies that are getting into things. You may have some aphids or uh, earwigs. But if it's a healthy habitat, those pests are going to be balanced out by the predators that are coming to eat them. So one thing that we just emphasize, though, is that if you freak out at the sight of a little uh, insect damage on your plants, you're going to have a really hard time with a healthy habitat because your birds need those insects. And they're going to help take care of them for you. They're going to keep them under control. But you have to kind of relax a little bit about letting the plants just have a little bit of damage. And you can see all sorts of things. This is, you know, they're feeding earwigs to each other, and they've got, I don't know what, that is, but something in there, and grubs and worms and caterpillars, and that guy had a spider and all sorts of things. This guy got a crane fly, so they're going to eat all sorts of different insects, but you have to invite them to your backyard. You have to make your backyard a place where the insects want to be, too. Okay. So just in summary, we want to have a variety. We want to have a diversity. We want to have seed-producing plants, nectar-producing plants, uh, insect-attracting plants, you want to have um, things that are going to be attracting flying insects. You want to have fruit plants, things like that. Um, and again, we've talked about this a little bit, but when you have a choice, native plants are always going to be your best option because those are the plants that our animals are looking for. So just as a quick rundown, as I said, most of you guys I'm sure know this already, but just as a quick review, when we talk about native plants, there's certain that means uh, shorthand for certain things. So we're talking about any plant that grows in a specific, specific area naturally. So California natives are generally what we're talking about. Now that's a pretty broad category. Bay Area California natives are going to be different than Southern California natives. So when possible, we would even encourage you to go one step further and really focus on Bay Area. California natives because our water regime is very different than Southern California. Our soil is very different than Southern California. It doesn't mean some of the Southern California plants aren't going to do well up here, but it just means there may not be as tight of an association with the animals that live up here and Southern California plants. So when possible, we try to encourage people to really focus on local natives. And again, California Native Plant Society is a wonderful resource for figuring out Okay, what grows in the San Francisco Bay Area? What is native to this specific area? Um, we're specifically talking about plants that were found here before habitat disturbance. Um, most people don't realize, for example, that palm trees are not native to Northern California, but they've been here for an awfully long time. We're going to talk a little bit more about what effect that has had on the native fauna as well, that there are birds that have actually adapted to that increase of palm trees. We're also talking specifically about things that came before Europeans, so we're really looking backwards to try to focus on the plants that were here before humans started bringing strange things. Again, mustard is not native to California. You would not know that by looking at any um, cut through and, and roadway in the area, but it really isn't. It was brought here by the early settlers in their vineyards and to help bring back nitrogen into the soil, but it's not a native plant. And I mentioned this already, <clears throat> but one of the reasons that we talk about native plants and how important they are is because 
They are adapted to our water system. We are basically a desert ecology. Uh, we get, um, or sorry, Mediterranean climate. We get very, very dry summers and springs. We get normally, in a good year, wet winters. But that's not always predictable. And our history has shown that we don't always get rain every single year. We don't always get a good rainfall. So our plants are pretty well adapted to that. So when we're planting things, for example, that are coming from, um, I'm trying to think of something that requires a lot of water. Let's say eucalyptus, right? That's not from our environment. It sucks up all the water and it takes the water out of the soil, doesn't make it available to other things. So we really want to be focusing on the plants that are going to be looking at our native people. Yeah. Uh, well, I just put our three of our porcupine agaves out in front, and we have the sun set, well, or front faces the, what, the setting sun. Do you think they're going to make it through the winter? They're pretty big plants. So I'm going to refer that specific question to the California Native Society folks, because I don't know the answer to specific It's really uh, for southern plants. Um, Southern states, yeah. Central American So I don't know if you guys have an idea of the uh, the porcupine agaves. That's not a plant I'm familiar with at all. Okay. So Thank yeah, you. sorry. That's just not something that I've read across. So I don't know that one. Yeah, I'm. I was gonna say I'm a little bit um, uh, narrow focused. I don't know a lot of Southern California native plants. My my focus has mostly been on the Northern California ones. Um, one of the advantages to the native plants in our area is they do really well with low amounts of water. Um, some of them only want a little bit of water in the summer and the fall when they're getting established, and they really don't want water at all beyond that. Um, I cannot tell you how many wildflowers, um, particularly the woolly blue curls, that I have killed because I thought it looked like it needed water. And so I kept giving it water because it just looked like it was drying out and then I drowned it and I killed it. And what I have learned is that, you know what, our native plants, they're used to it. They don't do it very much. But yeah, so my, my poor woolly blue curls, I've killed them multiple times until I finally left them alone and realized they don't need me to touch them, they don't need me to water them, they're happy the way they are, just leave them alone. Which meant my water bills went way down because I didn't have to keep drowning these poor plants. Um, and, as I said, the woolly blue curls, some of them actually don't want you to water them in the summer. Our sages and our coyote bush, our buckwheat, as long as they've got good root systems, they really just want to be left alone. They don't want a lot of summer water, which is very convenient because guess what happens when you water things in the summer in the heat and the long days? You have a lot of evaporation, so you're actually wasting a lot of that water. So leave them alone, let them be, they'll be very happy. And one thing we do like to mention, just as a quick aside, is all of the young plants, whether they're native or not, they're going to need a little bit of water to get going. So I don't want people thinking, oh, you're just going to plant the plant and just, you know, abandon it to its own devices. You're going to need to water it a little bit at the beginning, but then once it gets established and it gets those nice deep roots, they're going to be quite fine and quite happy, and in fact, happier than if you're monkeying around with them a lot. Now, one of the things that makes our native plants so important is what we call our targeted attractions. These are plants and animals that have evolved over thousands of years to help each other out. One of them provides food, one of them provides pollination. One of them provides uh, food, another one will provide protection, things like that. And so when we talk about this, I'm going to go through this a little bit quickly, but we want to think about that when we're planting our native plants as well. We want to think about what are the animals that are going to be using our plants. So for example, those tubular flowers I showed you, the California fuchsia, the fuchsia flower gooseberry, those are adapted and evolved to attract hummingbirds. And hummingbirds are looking for plants that have those tubular flowers. Um, a lot of times they're looking for red and orange, although my hummingbirds prove a liar of me and they go for the white flowers, but anyway. They are looking for things that they know, they recognize as having a good nectar supply. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about the hummingbirds, but for them, getting enough food each day is literally the difference between life and death. If they don't get enough food each day, their metabolism is not going to be able to uh, produce enough energy for them. Um, we talk about bees. They're going to be looking for the flatter flowers. They're going to be looking for things that are blues, purples, or white. 
um, California buckwheat. I don't know if you guys have ever seen one of those in full bloom. You walk near it, you just hear this bzzz. I mean, it's just thousands of bees and flies that are just adoring that one. Um, and as I mentioned, you know, especially with all the problems that we've been having lately with colony collapse disorder, our loss of our native bees, planting the, the bushy flowers, the ones with the flat ones, are really going to be great for attracting some of our native pollinators. Our moths are going to be looking for things that are light colored and very aromatic. Think about um, the night blooming jasmine, things like that, things that are going to be attracting ones. Um, that one's not a native one, but it's one that easily um, comes up when people think about aromatic flowers. And then a little bit harder to attract, but you think of like the yucca flowers and things like that. Our bats are going to be looking for large, night blooming, strongly aromatic flowers. So if you're really into attracting bats into your garden, you got to make sure that they've got something there that's going to be attracting to them. Okay. Um, I think most people colorful flowers, tubular flowers, butterflies, they've got those nice long proboscis that allows them to get in. And we're going to be talking a little bit more about this if you choose to do some supplemental feeding as well. So you're going to be thinking about what kind of animals might be coming. Okay, so just as a quick comment about supplemental feeding, people always ask me because Audubon, we're all about bird feeders, things like that. So I get two questions. One is, is it bad to give them supplemental feeding? Is it bad to give them seeds? And my answer is always a qualified, not really. I will always say, starting any conversation, if you can, it's always better to give it to them in a natural form. So if the opportunity arises and you have the choice, plant some flowers, plant some plants, give them the food that they are adapted to eating naturally. Now, sometimes that's not possible. Sometimes you don't live in an area where it's possible to do a lot of planting, or maybe you live in an area that um, has really bad soil or things like that, in which case you might want to consider some supplemental feeding. At the office in McClellan Ranch, we have a native plant garden, so we've got sage, and we've got fuchsia, we've got manzanita, and uh, hollyleaf cherry, we've got all sorts of different native plants. But we do also supplemental feed because we're trying to attract the birds to a specific area so that we can use them for education purposes. So that's another reason is you may want to be bringing the, the birds a little bit closer so that you can actually see them. Supplemental feeding, contrary to a lot of old wives' tales, is not going to change the birds' migration patterns. So by giving them food, you're not going to all of a sudden make our birds stop migrating. The reason being because most of the birds that are going to be coming to a bird feeder, not all of them, but most of them are native resident birds. They don't migrate anyway. So you're not going to be altering their behavior very much. The second reason is that by supplemental feeding, you're not really giving them anything that they wouldn't normally be finding in nature anyway. You're just giving it to them in an easier access. So again, it's not going to affect their behavior. So supplemental feeding is perfectly fine. Same rule of thumb for the supplemental feeding as for the natural feeding. If you want to attract a variety of animals to your backyard, you need to give them a variety of food. So we talk about you know, providing seeds and nuts and suet and mealworms. And I have some examples of what some of the feeders might look like and what some of the seeds. So I encourage you to take a look at that afterwards if you have questions about what kind of feeders would be appropriate. And again, I'm happy to answer questions about that as well. But I always go back to the if, given the chance, natural food is always better and native plants are the best of all. Okay. Come on. There we go. Now, I'm not going to talk too much about water because I think most people understand that animals need water. It's an important part of existence. Um, what I do want to mention, though, is just like with the plants, a variety and diversity of water sources is going to be important. Um, you can do anything from simply giving a tray of water, making sure that the water stays clean and it's changed on a um, regular basis. You can do a bird bath, you can do fountains. I've seen some wonderful solar powered, very elaborate tiered fountains and the birds just love to splash around them and in them. Birds and other animals really are going to be attracted to moving water though. If they need to, they will come to still water, but if you're trying to attract birds, especially to your backyard, 
moving water, the sound of that moving water is really a trigger for them. It's really a key for them to realize, oh, this is a good place to be. Because what that tells them is that the water is not stagnant, it's not going to be um, growing things that's going to be harmful to them. And you're not going to be having to worry about things like mosquitoes and whatnot like that. That's a big question people always ask me about having water. So moving water is best. If you can't do moving water, just make sure it's water that's cleaned and changed on a regular basis. Uh, again, in our office we just have a little tray that we fill up with water every day, but we just make sure we clean it and we rinse it out so that it doesn't have time to grow things or um, mosquitoes to lay their eggs in. And I don't know if you guys can see this little this little guy. This is a, um, a toey, a um, spotted toey, and he's just enjoyed himself a little bath. So they are going to be attracted to the water. Okay. And Again, moving water is going to be fast, lots of variety if possible, but otherwise just whatever you can do as long as it doesn't have time to go stagnant and grow algae. The last thing I'll mention is the shelter component. So during the spring, obviously birds are going to be looking for places for their young. They're going to be looking for places that are safe to lay their eggs. And the best, number one, the best option is to give them a wide variety of places that they can build their nests, hide, hunt for food, and when the babies are getting ready to fledge, when they're getting ready to leave the nest, they're going to be looking for places where they can kind of leap out of the nest and immediately get into cover so that they're protected. So if you're providing a lot of different levels and a lot of different densities, you're going to be attracting birds that are looking for places where they can raise their young. If you have not had the experience of getting to watch a bird nest and watch the babies grow up, it is phenomenal. It is just, you, you don't think about it making that much of a difference, but even just seeing that first little egg in the nest, it just does something to you. And it just is a wonderful experience. Hearing those little peep, 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 and watching those little mouths gaping, waiting for their moms and dads to come bring them food, it really is a phenomenal experience. So if you're providing healthy habitat, you're providing good shelter, you're going to be giving birds an opportunity to basically keep their populations alive and raise up the next generation. And it really is a neat experience. Now, I'm going to step off for a second. Oops, I forgot to grab this. Um, one thing I wanted to show you is, I don't know if you guys can see this, there is an option if you can't necessarily provide as healthy a habitat as you would like, or maybe there isn't a variety. Some of our birds, some of our native birds, are what are called obligate cavity nesters. They have to build their nests in holes of dead trees, things like that. The problem with that, of course, is that what's the first thing that gets chopped down anytime somebody wants to re-landscape or build a new house or anything? The dead trees. And you know, you can't really blame people. Who wants a dead tree sitting in their yard? It's not aesthetically pleasing. You've got termite problems. It's, it's a hazard. So unfortunately, our cavity nesters are really, really struggling in urban areas specifically to find enough dead trees where they can build their nests. So one of the things that we do talk about is it's possible, just like it's possible to supplemental feed, it's possible to give supplemental nesting sites. One of the things I will point out though is if you look at this nest box, it doesn't look like much. It's not very pretty. It doesn't have a lot of fancy colors on it. It doesn't have whirling things on it. It doesn't have windows or, you know, designs, it doesn't say welcome home, it doesn't have a doormat. As closely as possible, we try to mimic a dead tree so that a bird is going to see this and go, great, it's a dead tree, it's a perfect place for me to nest. I also want to point out really quickly, there's no perch on this nest box. The perches are really good for things like crows, raccoons, starlings, all of the things that might be interested in eating our babies. They're also really good for European house sparrows, and we're going to talk a little bit more about them as well. So if you do decide to supplemental um, cavity nest or you know, provide cavity nesters a, a location, you want to make sure that you're getting a nest box that's appropriate to the species that are out here. The East Coast species, they've got some different challenges. Their nest boxes are going to look a little bit differently. European nest boxes are going to look completely differently. They want a perch because the species that they're attracting need that perch. Our birds, however, 
don't want that perch. They want to just zip right into the hole. They don't want to have anything in their way. They don't want to have anything that a predator can use to lever itself into the nest box. So just make sure whatever you know, nest box you do choose, that you're using one that's appropriate to our California native species. Okay. And again, variety is key. You want to have, and this is the um, someone's backyard, Cheryl's backyard, but these are from McClellan Ranch. And you can see there's a lot of different layers. There's some open space. There's some low-lying herbs. There's some bushes, uh, the wildflowers. Variety is going to be key. That's what the birds are looking for, is places where they're going to be able to move around. And especially those babies. I don't know if you guys have seen newly fledged birds, but they're kind of ridiculous looking. They're not very good at flying. They're kind of awkward. They really need places where they can jump around and hide. Now the last thing I want to just mention really quickly before I turn to the specific birds that you're going to be hopefully seeing in your backyard is you want to make sure that when you're creating healthy habitat that you're thinking about some of the dangers that the birds specifically, but bees and butterflies as well, but some of the dangers that they may be encountering. Now one of the saddest things and one of the most common things that we talk about or we get asked questions about is this one, the window strikes. Okay? When you're planting things, when you're creating habitat next to a house, window strikes are going to be a challenge. And I am not going to lie and say that there's a foolproof method of reducing or eliminating window strikes. The fact of the matter is birds and windows are not happy bedfellows. They do not like to be in the same place. Most of our birds, most of our songbirds, do not have very good um, 3D vision. Their eyes are on the sides of their heads because they're very good at making sure they can see when predators are coming. But the problem is that that means they don't have very good depth perception. So when they see a window, if they see any reflection off of that window, let's say it's reflecting your tree or it's reflecting the ground, they think, oh great, there's a pathway, I can fly right through there. And if something happens that startles them and they're moving in an instant, they're going to be flying right into that window. Um, there are ways that you can limit the window strikes. And those are things that we encourage people to think about. For example, don't plant something right next to the window. Don't put your bushes right next to the window that's going to mask where that window is. Or completely cover the window with the bushes, one or the other. Right? So make sure you're either planting things far away, putting the feeders a little bit farther away, or putting them so close to the window that it's very obvious that there's nothing that's going to be reflecting in the window. There are devices, there are devices that you can hang outside of your window if you don't mind weird things hanging outside of your window. This is a feather guard and it basically is just a line of feathers that you hang outside of your window. You can put mesh outside of the window. Uh, one thing, if you happen to be redoing your windows and you have the wherewithal to do so, think about maybe putting in small paned windows as opposed to big giant bay windows. Uh, one of the things that really helps is if you can break up the outline of the window so that the birds have something to see that they know there's something there. There are decals that have UV uh, reflections on them. Um, you can put decals of spider webs, things like that. A variety is probably going to be good. You still may encounter some bird strikes. It's going to happen. But if we can reduce it, it's going to be helpful for the birds. The other things you want to think about, and I don't know if you guys can all see this one here, right? This is probably one of the number one problems that urban birds have to deal with. They gotta deal with window strikes, they've gotta deal with cars getting run over, they gotta deal with habitat loss, but really, this little guy here can kill millions of songbirds every year. They are terrible, terrible decimators of our wild bird populations. Um, if you live in an area where you have cats that roam the neighborhood, there are things like I mentioned the gooseberry, that you can plant around areas that you want to protect. Um, you can put pepper around the edges of your yard to help keep the birds and other things out. I mean, uh, keep the cats and other things out. You want to make sure you're not planting highly desirable foods or putting food uh, feeders out right where you know cats are going to be walking. And if you happen to be the owner of a cat, I would encourage you to consider keeping your cats indoors. Um, we were talking, Sherry and I were talking about this beforehand. So I have three cats. I am the proud owner of three cats. I love my cats. And they are indoor only cats. And the reason that my cats became indoor only, and this is before I started working for Audubon, is because I have one in particular who was a stray cat when I got her. 
and she was used to roaming around, so I kind of felt bad making her an indoor cat, so I was going to let her be indoor-outdoor, and we figured, you know, we'd work on it. But I was like, you know, but I'm going to bell her, because I don't want her bringing stuff home. So I'm going to put a little bell on her, so that the animals can know that she's coming, and she won't be able to bring home presents for me. So about a week after I belled her, I came home, and there was a bird on my floor. And I thought, okay, that's odd. It must have flown in the window or something, and she got it. Okay, so we'll get rid of that. And about a week later, I came home, and there was another bird on the floor. And this time, the cat was looking mighty smug about this. And what I discovered, because I was watching her afterwards, is that she learned how to walk, so she tucks her head in. And she muffles the bell. And so she was still able to hunt the birds, because she had learned how to muffle the bell. So one of the things that we do let people know, when we've got some information about um, keeping cats indoors, is these guys are incredible hunters. That is what they are designed to do, and they don't need to be hungry to hunt the birds. They're going to eat them, but they just want to play with them, really. So if you have cats, we do encourage you, if you're trying to create healthy habitat, consider bringing your cats indoors. Okay, so now we want to talk about, how are we doing on time? We want to talk a little bit about the birds that you actually might see. And I am going to try to use some of the sounds. So I'm going to hopefully not blow everybody's eardrums out because um, I want to play some of the sounds. So the first uh, birds that I want to talk about are the birds that are going to be coming looking for berries. The winter especially is a really great time for birds that are berry eaters. Now, one question I always get when I show this one, the American robin, is people always raise their hand and go, wait a minute. I thought robins were worm eaters. Isn't that what sort of the entire world knows robins eat? And if you remember at the very beginning, I showed you a picture of a worm eating, I mean, a, a robin eating a worm, right? Well, it's true. They are very good at, wor at eating worms, and they've got this funny little run that they do where they're, you know, they run, and then they stop, and they listen, and they run, and they stop, and they listen. They're very good at getting the worms. but. In the winter, they also will very much enjoy their berries. Now, unfortunately, both of these are eating non-native berries, which we would much rather them be eating native plants. Um, in particular, the cedar waxwing, they will come in the winter, so they're going to be starting to arrive now. I've been seeing a few of them out and about. They come in big groups. They're going to be in groups of 50, 60, 70 birds all together. And the way that they feed is they, they come to a tree, they come to a bush, they completely strip it of all the berries, and then they move on. And so what they're looking for is kind of little corridors where they can bounce or, or fly from tree to tree, bush to bush, and hopefully have enough food that they can move through the area throughout the year. So they're going to be looking for dense areas where there's lots of berries. So you can plant a toy on, your neighbor can plant a toy on, next door neighbor down there, it'll give them a little bit of a corridor where they can be looking for. Let's see if I can, and hopefully you guys all know what these guys sound like, but let's see if I can play the sound. Come on, here we go. Okay, so let's see if this works. You guys recognize the sound of our American Robin? So, Robins are a member of the thrush family, and their songs are very pure tones, and you can hear them kind of cutting through. And one thing I'm not going to talk too much about in this talk, because that's a whole other conversation, but one thing that's interesting to note is all of the birds have adapted their songs particular to where they're living. So these guys are going to be mostly down on the ground and through the bushes, and their, their songs are designed to kind of carry through that environment. So we'll talk a little bit about that. But. Not too much, I just wanted to throw that out there. Okay, now we've talked about the nectar, and obviously the bird that we're talking about when we're talking about nectar feeders are hummingbirds. The most common bird that we have in this area that's a hummingbird is the Anna's hummingbird. And a couple things to pay attention to to the Anna's hummingbird. So first of all, if you guys notice, they don't touch the plant when they're feeding, right? <clears throat> in fact, if you've ever seen a, a, a hummingbird's feet, they're tiny. They look like these little microscopic little toes. They're not really going to be sitting and perching and, and drinking nectar. So they're going to be looking for flowers and plants that have tubular, hanging, projecting flowers. They're going to be looking for things that other birds really can't get to. 
The reason that the hummingbirds can get to this is because of their physiology. They have some pretty amazing flight muscles and flight physiology. Um, and again, those of you that have seen hummingbirds, you know you can't even see their wings. They beat so fast, right? Because the way that they beat their wings, and this is you get me doing the show and tell now. So most birds, right, they flap up and down, right? That's how most birds fly. Hummingbirds, they make a figure eight with their wings. And it, it allows them to do it so fast that they can hover in place, and they can also back up. So they're one of the few birds that can fly backwards. You think of any other bird, like a robin or something, trying to fly backwards, right? It's going to fall. It's going to stall. These guys can even fly upside down. So they're going to be looking for flowers that nobody else can get to. So if you want to attract hummingbirds, you want to be planting things with nice tubular flowers. And I said, you know, most people think of hummingbirds as coming to the red flowers, which is true. They do. But you'll notice neither of these are red flowers, right? They're really looking for the shape. That's what's telling them that this is a good nectar plant. Now, one caveat that I will mention about Anna's hummingbirds in particular is they are incredibly territorial. Incredibly territorial. This is something I had to learn when I moved out to California because I got attacked by a hummingbird a few times because I was getting a little too close to its space. These guys will go after anything. They will chase away other hummingbirds. They will chase away mockingbirds. They'll chase away crows. They'll chase away cats. They'll chase away people. If you happen to look at them funny, they're going to chase you away. Very, very territorial. The most common comment I get about the hummingbirds is, okay, I planted these sage bushes and I get one hummingbird. That's it. I want a whole bunch of hummingbirds. I like hummingbirds. I want more than one. Well, the problem is, is if you have one sage plant or even a couple of sage plants, you have one hummingbird that has declared those to be his sage plants. And he's not going to let anybody else near them except for maybe his mate of that particular year. So if you're looking to attract a lot of different hummingbirds, large groups of them. There's two ways to do it. One, let's say you've got a nice yard that has a side over here, a space here, and a side over here. The best thing to do is you plant something over here, and you plant something all the way over here, so that when the hummingbird comes over here, he can't see what's going on with his other plants. So he won't know to chase something away, because he just doesn't know what's going on there. Or, and this is my preferred method, because I also like lots of hummingbirds, you just plant so many hummingbird appropriate plants that they can't possibly defend them all and eventually their little brains will figure out, oh, there's enough food. I don't need to defend this anymore because there's plenty for all of us. So you just saturate the area with lots of hummingbird plants or hummingbird feeders and eventually they will learn that they don't have to go crazy and defend it. The reason that they're so aggressive, the reason that they're so territorial is because they have such an incredibly high metabolic rate that they basically have to eat constantly. They have to be constantly on the lookout for calories. And if somebody comes into their territory, that's nectar that they may not be able to get. That's food that's not going to be able to support their metabolic rate. And that possibly could mean they're not going to survive the night. So there is a reason they're not just being difficult little birds. There is a reason why they are so aggressive and so territorial. But there are ways that you can overcome that if you want to encourage them to come to your garden. We have a lot of birds that are seed eaters, and one thing I like to point out is, this is what we talk about when we're talking about adaptations, you can notice that these guys are seed eaters by their small little bills. They've got a short triangular bill perfect for crunching on things, right? So one of the most common birds that you'll see in the area is the house finch. Now one thing I want to uh, note about house finches is they're not actually native to California. They weren't brought here by anybody, but they've had a range expansion as humans have spread into California. And so they followed the humans, basically. So they do very well with human habitation, which is why they're called house finches, because you'll often find them around houses and places of urban development. They are almost exclusively seed eaters, except they will also eat small insects like beetles. And here's the fun thing about the house finches. So you see this guy here. This is a male house finch, and he's got this beautiful red feathers, right? Red is an extremely difficult color for birds to produce on their own. In fact, most birds that are red or pink get that pigment from the food that they're eating. In this case, he's getting it from the beetles that he's eating. 
So our house finches have a wide range of colors. If you see a male house finch that is more yellow or golden or orange, he's not getting his beetles. He's mostly focusing on the seeds. The more red, more carmine they are, the more beetles that he's getting. So what does this matter? How does this apply to you as a gardener? If you are providing supplemental feeding, you're giving them seeds, and that's about it. You're not really producing uh, plants that produce seeds, or you're not giving them uh, plants that attract insects. You're going to have a lot of yellow and orange house finches. Evolutionarily, that's a signal to females that they're not as healthy, that they're not getting as good food, and they're not as desirable as a mate. So if you are promoting yellow and orange feathers in your birds and your male uh, house finches, you actually may be reducing their opportunities to mate because the females want the red ones. So by having healthy habitat, by attracting the beetles, you're going to be supporting the mate selection of our house finches. I bet you didn't know it was going to be that specific. But if you can produce the beetles, I mean, if you can attract the beetles, you're going to be helping your male house finches look a little sexier to the females. They're going to have an easier time attracting the mate. Our goldfinches, on the other hand, that color is something that they produce naturally, so you don't have to worry about changing their color. But one thing I like to point out about the goldfinches is, can you guys see what this goldfinch is sitting on? Can you guys see what this plant is? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's thistle, right? We usually think of thistle as being a completely useless, undesirable plant. Well, in some respects it is, but our goldfinches actually will sit on top of the thistle and they will pick the seeds out of the thistle. Now, does this mean you should go plant star thistle? No, because most of the European thistle that we have in the area is incredibly invasive, in part with the help of these guys, because they pick the seeds out, they go off, they poop them out, and then they plant more thistle. The problem, of course, is that thistle is very dense, it's very difficult to control, and where you're gonna have European thistle, you're not gonna be growing a lot of other things. So these guys will eat the seeds out of the buckwheat, they'll eat the seeds out of the thistle, Given the choice, let's plant some buckwheat. Let's give them something other than the thistle. Or, if you're a little more adventurous, I've never tried this, but there is some native thistle. The cobweb thistle is a beautiful plant. I've never been quite brave enough to plant it myself because I'm a little clumsy, and I know that I tend to bump into my plants, so I haven't been willing to do that. But if you have the space, try the cobweb thistle or some of the other native plants that are attractive to our goldfinches. Okay. Now, these ones are some pretty common ones most people know about. These are some more of our seed eaters. And I'll put seed eaters in parentheses <clears throat> because they eat other things as well. But I want to introduce you to a couple of them. This is our dark-eyed jungle. And this is one of the birds that you're going to see hopping around on the ground looking for the seeds. And I love this picture because if you guys can see this, you can see that he's kind of planted himself, thrown his head back, and he's getting ready to sing. They are incredibly enthusiastic with their songs, and I wanted to play the song for you because they are just hilarious, and it's this funny little sound. Once you hear it, you will never mistake it for anything else. It almost sounds like a mechanical sound. It sounds like something electric or electronic. Right? So that is our dark eyed junko. And we get the ones in this area that are incredibly dark. They look like they've got a ski mask on. Other areas have ones that are a little bit lighter. But they are incredibly funny. They are very, very curious little birds. And they are not shy about letting you know that they are there. So these guys are not going to be the ones that are hiding and waiting for you to walk past. They're going to just kind of look at you and be like, yeah, what's up? I'm eating seeds. So they don't really mind you too much. This one here, the morning dove, hopefully all of you guys have seen morning doves. Um, these are the ones that you will see them sitting on the telephone wires in the mornings. And they are, I want you to notice their spelling, right? It's morning as in sadness, that they are mourning, they're in sorrow. Because when they call, they do that beautiful hoo, 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 and it sounds like they're crying. It sounds like they're, they're sad. Now, Morning doves are kind of funny little birds. They will come and eat whatever has fallen on the ground, so they're kind of the cleanup crew of the bird world. And they really 
give the definition of bird brain. So if you talk about a bird being kind of stupid, um, it really is a morning dove. They, they're very pretty, they're very close, they're very cute, but they're not really very sharp. The way that a morning dove builds its nest is it'll bring some twigs or something in its beak, and it'll stop and it'll get tired and it'll drop the twigs. And if the twigs happen to stay there and they don't roll off, that's where they're going to build their nest, which means that their nests get built in places like the tops of fence posts, or on top of lights, or on um, tool sheds, or things like that. And then they'll lay their eggs, and their nests are these just kind of tangled mess of twigs. They don't really look like much. And they'll lay their eggs in that mess of twigs, and if the egg happens to not blow out of the nest, or it doesn't roll out of the nest, they will lay on, or they'll sit on it, they'll incubate it, and they'll produce some um, baby doves. If the eggs do happen to roll out of the nest or get blown out of the nest, they'll just keep trying. So what they lack in nest building skill, they make up for in just sheer persistence. And there are some doves that have been known to try seven or eight times a season, and they will just keep laying the eggs over and over, and hopefully one of them will eventually not fall out of the nest. So you'll often see them nesting in places that just seem absolutely ridiculous. Again, what they lack in skill, they make up for in sheer persistence. And so they will just keep trying until one of those eggs doesn't roll out, they can incubate it, and they can hatch it. Now this one, this one here is our Western Scrub Jay. And he is very tied to our oak trees. Now, you guys can see this beak here, this nice big chunky bill. They are really designed at cracking things. So they're really good at crunching and cracking things. Ideally, they're going to be crunching and cracking acorns. But just like a squirrel, one of the things that they do is they will gather the acorns and they will bury them to save them for later. They don't always remember where they buried them. And as you know, what happens when you put an acorn in the ground and you leave it there is it sprouts and it becomes an oak tree. So they are very dependent on the oak trees, but the oak trees are also somewhat dependent on these guys. And that is one comment I get a lot is, I end up with all these little saplings all over my yard. Where on earth are those coming from? Well, it may be from the scrub jays, that they are helping to plant those oak trees all around your yard. The other thing, though, that this bill is really good for is they are also really good at eating eggs. So they are a nest predator. Now, Oftentimes, that gives them a bad rap. People kind of look down on the Western scrub jay. They don't really like them very much because of that predation. But these guys are native. They are native to California. They're native to the Bay Area. And their predation rates are manageable in the sense that the birds that are native to this area that they may be predating upon, they have adapted their laying patterns to deal with the predation from the scrub jays. So they may lay a few extra eggs than they normally would, knowing that one or two of them are going to get eaten. The challenge comes when you have something like a raccoon that comes and eats the whole nest, or something like a crow that eats all of the babies, things like that. They're not really adapted to that level of predation, but they are adapted to the low levels of predation that the scrub jays result in. So I wanted to play the western scrub jay sound, because this is one that's familiar to most people. And sometimes I do this one myself, and I'll imitate it, but I'm, um, for the sake of saving my voice, I'm going to let you guys hear it. So this is our scrub jay, our Western during the breeding season, but again, they are an important part of the ecosystem. They do help support some of our native plants. Okay. Now, these ones are kind of the, they'll eat fruit and berries and a little bit of everything. The first one I like to talk about is this guy here, the northern mockingbird. Now, he does get a little bit of a bad rap, too. Um, the northern mockingbird is native to the area. They are pretty aggressive. They are the ones that will chase you from your front door if they happen to build their nest too close to your door. It doesn't matter that your door was there first. If your door is too close, they will chase you away. They will chase the cats away. They will chase the cars away. I've seen them going after car windows, mostly during the breeding season. 
Well, the northern mockingbird, of course, gets its name because it imitates the sounds of lots of other animals and lots of other birds. And basically, what they're doing is they're showing off. They are trying to attract a female. So the male is listening to all of the sounds around him and using that sound to help him show off to a female and show the female how healthy he is, how long he's lived, and show that he's a good potential mate. So I want to play the mockingbird sound. So that one only had four or five different songs, right? The mockingbirds learn new songs throughout their lifetime. So the more songs that the mockingbird can show, the longer it shows that it's lived and the healthier a mate it potentially can be. Now, the funny things about mockingbirds, in a rural setting, in a natural setting, they're going to be hearing things like scrub jays and robins and hawks and squirrels and things like that. They're going to be learning the sounds of the birds and the other animals around them. However, our urban mockingbirds have an entirely different soundscape available to them, and they will learn those sounds. We had a mockingbird that lived in my apartment complex for several years, and it learned the sounds of the car alarms in the mockingbird, in the, the parking lot. So, three o'clock in the morning or so, we would have this mockingbird that would start going and you know, you'd, you'd see kind of people's heads going out, was that, was that my car? Was that mine? And it was just a bonanza for this, this bird because it got, you know, 20 different sounds in the space of five minutes. It was great. Um, I also had a mockingbird when I was living down in Southern California that lived right outside of my bedroom window and he had a nest, he and his mate had a nest there. And he learned the sound of my alarm clock, which <laughs> at three in the morning is not so fun. Um, and you'll notice that I keep saying he's singing at three in the morning, right? Most common complaint I get about mockingbirds is I get these phone calls in the spring and somebody just goes, there's this bird, and I'm like, oh yeah, that's a northern mockingbird. And I'm like, but wait, I haven't even said anything. Let me guess. It's standing on the lamppost at three in the morning, singing, and you can't sleep. And they're like, yeah, how did you know? How do I get it to shut up? Well, the problem with the mockingbirds is in the spring, as I mentioned, it's the males that are doing the singing. They are looking for females. They are so hopped up on testosterone that it doesn't take much to convince them that it's time to sing. And in an urban setting, they have wonderful things like street lights and porch lights. And heck, the, the moon will do. It doesn't take much. Any little bit of light will convince that bird it is morning, it is time to sing, and as long as he is still trying to find a mate, he will sing his little heart out. So I always tell people, well, you know, just help him find a girlfriend and he'll stop singing. He'll be fine. But they do help eat the berries, they do help spread seeds, so they are an important part of our birds. Now, these two I introduced because it goes back to a conversation or a comment that I made a little bit earlier about plants that have become almost naturalized that are not native. Now, our bullets orioles and our hooded orioles join us in the spring. They are going to be looking for nectar and fruit. In fact, we always know that the, the hooded oriole in particular has visited and has arrived at our um, office because the hummingbird feeder has been turned upside down and has fallen on the ground. So we know that it's time to put the oriole feeder out. He's a little too big for the hummingbird feeder, but he's going to try to sit on it and drink out of it anyway. Now, the interesting thing about both the hooded and the bullock's orioles is that when they build their nests, they have to use the fibers from palm fronds. So, we mentioned earlier, palm trees are not native to California, which means our orioles are not native to California either. But they have followed the palm trees. As people have planted palm trees, they have followed those locations and have been able to survive and find areas where they can live. So this one's a little bit tricky. If you're trying to attract the orioles, you want to have fruit or berries or something, but you have to have palm trees. And that's where it gets a little bit difficult because I don't necessarily advocate, advocate rather, planting palm trees. But in this area, it's almost impossible to go down a block without finding a palm tree or two. So as long as there's somebody else who's planted them and you plant some plants that have the fruit or the berries, you're gonna be getting some 
corneals. And you'll hear them. They have a very distinctive chatter sound when they come. Let's see if I can play it for the Oreo. Hooded Oreo. Very sharp, kind of um, chatter sound. It kind of sounds like little children kind of making funny noises at each other. But again, you don't necessarily need to plant palm trees for these guys as long as there's a palm tree in the area. Okay. Now, I talked about the insects, and these are the last group of birds that we'll talk about, is what are going to be coming to hunt for insects in your yard? if it's a good habitat. Now, one thing I want to just kind of give you a quick preview. There's a lot of them. There's a lot of birds that are looking for insects. By far the most uh, important food source for our birds is our insects. So I'm not talking specifically about insects today, but if you're planting healthy habitat, you're using the native plants, you're going to be attracting these insects that the birds are going to be eating. So these are our little guys. So we've got our oak tit mouse, our chickadee, our black phoebe, and the bush tit. One thing I want you guys to notice is that you can tell that these are insect eaters by these very small, narrow bills that they all have. But here's the cool thing about our insect eaters. Although they are all eating insects, they're all doing it in a different way, and they're all going to be focusing on slightly different insects. So for example, our bush tit, is a tiny, tiny little bird. They're about the size of my thumb, right? They're not very big birds. And I don't know if you guys can see this in this penstemon, but this is a penstemon that's growing up. And then we've got one, two, three, four, five, I think six bush tits. They're all hanging off of this one plant. What they're looking for is they're looking for the very tiny, small insects, like aphids, that are underneath the leaves. And they will just sit on a plant and just devour any insect that they can find, and then they fly off. They are in uh, very social, social birds, but they're going to do a really good job at keeping control of those pests, those little mites, the, the aphids, the things that you know are there, you can't really pick them off yourself because that would take forever. So the bush tits are going to take care of it for you. And as I said, they're very, very small, they're very light, they're very... Um, shy in the sense they like to stay in the bushes, but they're noisy. These are the ones that kind of are the sound of the bushes. They're like <laughs> So they make lots of noise, and they like to be very social. They tend to be in very big groups. Now we contrast that with our oak titmice and our chickadees. Now the oak titmice, I don't know if you guys can see this picture very well, but they have this cute little crest right on the top of their head. And that's how the oak titmouse lets you know whether he's happy with you or not. Oak tit mouse is a little bit of a solitary creature. You're going to see maybe one or two together if they're, they're mate, but that's about it. And they are pretty territorial. And the way that they will let you know is that little crest goes straight up, and that tells you, oh, I am not happy. And he will chatter at you to chase, chase you away. They're not aggressive like some of the other ones, but he will let you know that you're in his space. And the oak tit mouse, what he will do is he picks the insects off the surface off the surface of the leaves and the bark. His friend, the chestnut back chickadee, is the one that's going to be picking the insects underneath the leaves. So you're going to get a slightly different suite of insects depending on what location of the plant the bird is foraging on. Now the chickadees, I have a warm place in my heart for chickadees. They are the state bird of Massachusetts, Massachusetts, which is where I grew up. So they're one of the first birds I learned how to identify when I moved to California. The chickadees are a very, very social bird. They are the ones that are going to be in the big flocks. And if you ever go out walking with a birder, they're going to do something what's called a pish. They're going to make noises so that you can attract the birds. And it's, you make this sound, it goes psh, psh, psh. And it's imitating kind of an alarm call. And I can almost guarantee you that of any bird that's going to come visit to see what's going on, it's going to be the chickadee. You go outside and you're gardening and you're kicking up dirt, the chickadees are going to be standing there watching you, like, what are you doing? What is that? What is that noise? They are very, very curious. They are also the ones that people will tell stories about, you know, that they stand there for a while with the seeds in their hands, that the chickadees are the ones that will come, because they're very curious, they're a little bit fearless, and they will come and visit your garden. And I don't know if you can see this, but he's got a nice little fat spider in his beak. Um, so they're going to be picking the things that are living off of the undersides of the leaves. This little one here, this one is a black phoebe, 
and they are what's called a flycatcher. So they are a great bird to have, especially if you have any sort of water nearby. If you have a creek or a pond, anything that might be breeding flying insects like moths, mosquitoes, dragonflies, uh, crane flies, these guys are going to be the ones that eat that. And the way that they do it is they will sit on a branch and they kind of wag their tail back and forth, kind of like a runner getting ready to leap off the starting line. They'll kind of sit there and wag. As soon as an insect flies past them, they go out, they catch it in their beak, and they immediately go right back to the spot that they have. So they're very loyal to the sites that they have. And they get their name because they make the sound. They go, beep, 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 beep. So they get their name because they're calling their sound. And these guys, as I said, they're wonderful to have because they will help control mosquito populations and moth populations and things like that. But they do want to live near water. So they're going to be looking for uh, water sources. Now, sadly, that can sometimes be as simple as a watered lawn. But really what's good for them is going to be a creek or a stream or something that's going to be uh, attracting the insects that live in the water. Okay. Now, I don't want to go into all the detail for all of these birds because I think we are a little bit... How are we doing with time? Oh yeah, we're very short on time. But I do want to show you a couple of the examples of some of the other insects that are going to be attracting our birds. Now, one that I like to talk about is this western bluebird. Western bluebirds are kind of an interesting species. They are obligate cavity nesters, so they are one of the ones that these nest boxes are going to help attract. But they have very, very specific habitat requirements. The western bluebirds are looking for meadows. They're looking for open spaces where they can hover. They'll go down and grab, I don't know if you guys can see this big fat caterpillar that he has in his beak. They'll grab um, grasshoppers, crickets, caterpillars, things like that and they will hover in place and then go back and they want a solitary tree or something that they can perch on to eat their food. So they don't want a lot of dense canopy like the other birds do. They want to have nice open spaces, meadows. Um, they really are very fond of places like cemeteries, golf courses, places where there's some open space. The problem is, is that they're also incredibly vulnerable to bioaccumulation of toxins. Because they're eating things like grubs and caterpillars, when there's a lot of spraying going on, they are going to be affected by that accumulation of toxins in their system. So if you have open space area, meadows area, you want to make sure it's a place where there's not a lot of chemicals being put down so that they can feed. But they are awfully fun, and they're very good parents. Western bluebirds are very good parents. They have up to 12 babies um, a breeding season and they will stay with the babies and teach them how to hover and how to catch the food. And so a lot of times what you'll see is you'll see a father bluebird on one end and all the little babies sitting in a line between them and a mother bluebird on the other side. And they're all kind of watching each other and they'll you know, kind of encourage each other to go get the food. So they're, they're a lot of fun to watch, but they do have very specific habitat requirements. Now the other one I wanted to point out is this one here. This is a white-breasted nuthatch. And the first thing people always tell me is, oh, I think you put the slide on upside down. <laughs> and I did not. This is the actual position that the white-breasted cut hatch will hang out in. You guys notice their long, skinny beak. They are very, very good at getting that beak into the little crevices on the bark. So what they will do is, as I mentioned, the oak tip mice will pick the things off the surface of the leaves. The chickadees will pick the things off the underside of the leaves. These guys will pick the insects out of the bark. And so they will go down head first, down, and they kind of go around in a circle, down, 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 picking all the insects up, and then they fly back up to the top, and then they do it again, and they come head first down the tree. And so you just kind of watch them making their little circuit as they're looking for their insects as they come down the trees and the bushes. Um, our wrens are also insect eaters. Wrens get a little bit of a bad rap. They are pretty territorial and they can be pretty aggressive but as you can see they are also insect eaters and personally i love the buick wrens because i feel like they're these little tiny birds they're about this big not including their tail and they are really the napoleons of the, the songbird world because for such a small bird they have such an incredible attitude and these are the ones that will make all sorts of noises to tell you that they are not happy with you being in their space. So I wanted to play you a few experiments songs. It's quite amusing.
And they just have that jaunty little tail that just fills up with attitude. It's great. And the Buick's friends have, I would say, maybe 10 to 12 different sounds that they can make. So they'll, uh, one of the things that a lot of people recognize is they make this kind of it's like this weird little buzzy sound that basically is their alarm call that's telling you you're in their space. But they are very common in urban areas and the more bushy areas that you can provide for them that provide both cover and insects, the more likely it is that you're going to attract the, the wrens. And the house wren, I'm going to play this one for you as well. The house wren is really our songster of the group because they just have this beautiful, beautiful liquid sound. Happy, happy little sound. So if you have the house runs in the area, you're going to have a lot of noise in your backyard. But they're going to be helping to catch the insects, eating those grubs and the worms and the caterpillars. Now, the last couple ones I wanted to show you are um, our toadies, which are on this side here. And these guys are our ground feeders. <clears throat> they're the ones that are going to be looking for things under the, um, the understory, under the leaf litter, things like that. And the toey, the California toey, is probably the most difficult one to spot because they're just sort of brown and they blend in very well. But you guys will know you have a California toey, and this is where you get to see me do my dance. Um, you will know if you have a California toey if they're doing what's called the toey two-step. They have this little dance where they do this thing where they jump forward and back, jump forward and back. And they just do this kind of all day long looking for insects, and what they're doing is they're kicking the leaf litter out of the way so that they can look for insects or seeds or other things like that. And they will just kind of do this little jump and jumpy dance. And their cousin, the spotted toey, well, they're a little daintier. They'll just use one foot at a time. But they're not quite as energetic about it. But these guys are both going to be looking for things like brush piles, dense brushes that they can move things underneath. And they're going to be looking for things that produce a lot of leaf litter. So you'll often see them um, you know, under the coyote bush or under the toyon, digging around, things like that. And I want to mention our woodpeckers because the woodpeckers, they get kind of in trouble sometimes, especially these guys are acorn woodpeckers. If you notice, what he's doing is he's actually stuffing the acorn into the wood. So the acorn woodpeckers are looking for places like dead trees that they can drill holes in and then they stuff the acorns in, like you can see over here. And it serves two purposes. The acorns serve as food storage. So basically, they're holding those acorns in, you know, for times of need. They'll eat them later. But they also are using those acorns as uh, bait, I guess you would say. As the acorn starts to rot, it starts to attract insects. And then they will eat the insects. Now, our acorn woodpecker and our nettles woodpecker are both important species because one of the things that they do is they actually help control um, damaging beetles and other insect borers that might be damaging the trees. So we think of, oh, you know, a hole in the tree can't possibly be a good thing, but it's better to have a hole in the tree than a beetle that's going to be eating out your heartwood. So they're actually very important to the trees to help protect them from damaging insects. The problem, and this is where they run into their difficulty, is the acorn woodpeckers are incredibly social. They have large colonies. They like to be in large groups. And these are the ones that you hear going, Yakub, 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 Yakub. They're constantly talking to each other. They want to build their granary trees. They want to put their acorns and they stuff them into dead wood. Well, we already mentioned the problem with lack of dead wood gets chopped down. So if you happen to be in a yard, and you happen to be next to a house, and there's no dead trees around to stuff your acorns in and drill your holes into, guess what you're gonna drill into? <laughs> the side of somebody's house. So they get into a lot of trouble because they're drilling into the people's houses, and of course people don't like having acorn holes in their, I mean, uh, <laughs> woodpecker holes in the sides of their houses. So we encourage people, don't just kill them, don't shoot them, don't poison them. What we encourage you to do is maybe just put up a two by four or something, something else that they can use to stuff those acorn, acorns in. Because all they're trying to do is they're trying to save some dinner for later. Right? So, uh, as I said, these guys do get a little bit in trouble with their human um, neighbors, but all they're looking for is a place to store their acorns. 
Now, the last two birds I want to mention are the ones that I've kind of talked about a little bit that are relating to our invasive species. So we've talked a little bit about invasive plants, how they can alter the ecosystem, they block space for other plants, they take up a lot more water. Well, we have invasive birds as well. And interestingly enough, the European starling and the European house sparrow do really, really well with non-native plants. So, if you don't want to have non-native birds, one of the solutions is to have only native plants. They don't really like our native plants very much. They don't, it's too much work for them to get the food. It's harder for them to find the things that they like to eat. And there's a reason why the European house sparrow gets that name, because it's very, very well adapted to humans. It's adapted to the ornamental plants that humans in this area in particular tend to plant. It's very well adapted to eating the trash. It's very well adapted to using weird things that I've seen, ribbons and tinfoil and um, yarn and all sorts of funny things, bottle caps in their nests. They will use anything that they can grab in their nests. Very well adapted. The problem is both of these species are very aggressive and they're very competitive with our native species. They will compete with them for nesting locations. In fact, they'll actually pull out the eggs of other birds or pull out the babies of other birds. Starlings will actually pull out the adults, will yank them out of their nesting sites. They're very competitive for their food. Um, and they have really, really done a really, um, they've done a number on some of the populations in some of our species. One of the ones that you guys might have heard of is, uh, have you guys heard of the purple martin? So purple martins are a member of the swallow family. And they're a colonial nesting species, they nest in big groups, and they're a fairly large bird. They're about the same size as the starling. And unfortunately, what has happened is the starlings will come in and they will take over a colony of purple martins and they'll pull all the purple martins, literally pull the adults out of the nest, they'll break their eggs and they'll take over the nesting sites. And as a result, purple martins in the United States are really, really struggling. And it's one of those species that we don't have a good fix for because there's not a really easy way to allow the purple martins to nest without the starlings coming in. But again, one of the things that's an interesting association is that these guys do really well when we plant ornamentals that are not native to California. So one thing we encourage people to do is think about, again, using your native plants and that will help reduce the populations of some of these non-native species that we don't want to have in the area. So those are the last birds that I was going to introduce to you. And it's kind of the, you know, the million miles a minute bird introduction because um, there's a lot of birds that I could talk about and obviously we don't have time to talk about all of them. But hopefully you'll start getting a sense of the associations that our native birds have with our native plants, how important our native plants are, and how important the habitat elements are to creating the healthy habitat. Um, and maybe you know, once you get things going or you start looking outside, you'll start recognizing some of the species that we've shown you today and start being able to recognize what the birds are that are desirable and that you hope to see in the area. So with that, I think I've got some time for questions. I think I've got about maybe five minutes or two minutes or so. Yeah. Toby, would you suggest a good bird book for folks out here who uh, might want to get oh, something you. to take home and so they can identify birds? Yeah, there are a lot. And unfortunately, that was the one thing I forgot to grab, which is kind of sad. But there are quite a few bird books that are really good. A lot of people like the Sibley Guide to Western Birds. That's one of the most popular ones. Um, the National Geographic Field Guide to Western Birds is also a really, really good one. Um, and then there are some local ones. If you really want to focus on the birds that are in the area, there is a field guide that is specific to birds of California, um, and there's one that's specific to the birds of the San Francisco Bay. So there are some other options for the local species as well. And Audubon has a app for uh, yeah. bird uh, yep. uh, Yeah, unfortunately, I don't have a smartphone. <laughs> so I actually don't have that app, otherwise I would show you guys how to use it. Um, but yes, Audubon has a lovely app that you can download onto your smartphone, and um, they, you, know, you can group it by different sizes and, and body shapes and, and tax, you know, taxonomy and stuff like that. Yeah. Yes, all the way back. The purple martins that you mentioned, I've heard about those birds my whole life. Mm -hmm. I have never knowingly seen them, but are they, do they survive in this area at 
Well, they are an occasional resident of the Bay Area, but they have been so decimated by the European starlings that I would be shocked if anybody has seen one in recent years. Um, and the problem is, so the question I get, of course, all the time is, well, so what? What does it matter if there are no more purple martins? Purple martins, like other swallows, are incredibly important natural pest control because one of the things that they eat is they're looking for swarms of insects. They're looking for swarms of mosquitoes, swarms of gnats, swarms of biting flies, swarms of moths. And they really help control the populations of some of these undesirable insects. Our starlings don't eat those. They eat the seeds, the grubs, and the other things. And so when we lose our purple martins, unfortunately, we're also losing our pest control, which means that we have to deal with things like, well, now we have mosquito problems, and so now we have to spray for the mosquitoes, and that puts chemicals and toxins into the environment. So this very, very unpleasant cycle. Uh, but yeah, I, I have never seen a purple martin at all. Um, they are very elusive. They're very difficult to find because their populations in North America have just been completely decimated because of the starlings. With starlings, I have lived places where there have been huge, huge flocks of starlings. Mm -hmm. But in my neighborhood, which is Berryessa area of mm -hmm. San Jose, I don't know when I've seen a starling. That's great. But what would I do then if there happened to be a stray purple martin anywhere around? Um, the likelihood of seeing a single stray purple martin is slim to nil. Um, as I said, they're a, a colonial species, so they're going to be in large groups. Mm -hmm. So they're going to be more um, in the Central Valley areas where they can um, capture all the insects and they can be in large, in large flocks, which mm -hmm. is also the same area that the starlings really like. Yeah. So it, it's a problem. And as I said, I've never seen one. I've never seen a purple martin in the wild, and it kind of breaks my heart because they're such a beautiful bird and 